for joining us. This Pauhana, um, the focus of this evening is reforming cash bail. Our Social Justice Council, ADOR, and the 8th Principal Task Force are sponsoring the Pauhana. The Reverend TJ, Carla, Kathy, and myself will be sharing information about cash bail. I just want to put out there, we are not experts in any way about cash bail. Um, speaking for myself, I'm really just learning about it, maybe since about six months ago. So um, join us on this journey as we learn more and um, yeah, share that information. I do want to make a distinction. If you see in Carla's and my um, backgrounds, it says reform cash bill rather than eliminate cash bill. Um, choosing reforming as a strategy, our Hawaii state legislators are using this strategy to present legislation that hopefully will get passed. So um, some of us do identify as abolitionists and we would like totally to eliminate cash bill, but we realize that it's much more practical to make any gains if we look at it from a reforming standpoint. And I just wanna let you know, there will be an action item presented during the last few minutes of Pauhana, so hold tight for that. And if you have any questions, please put them in your in the chat box. We'd appreciate that. So now I'd like to do a land acknowledgement and set the tone for this evening. Although we are not physically together in the same space today, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the physical places and spaces we each inhabit a Native Hawaiian and other Indigenous lands, whose histories are long, rich, and storied, whose peoples are alive and actively seeking a return of their lands and spiritual homes. The history by which these lands came to be colonized is one of deep and persistent injustice. May we remember this our collective history, and may our time together help us to dismantle the continued settler colonialism and white supremacy, which are legacies of that history. May we together reimagine and create a future in which we inhabit this land in stewardship, kinship, and abundant love for all. To Reverend TJ. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here. This is our weekly Pauhana. And uh, it seems to be the custom so far this month where we're uh, having uh, beautiful takeovers of our, our weekly Pauhana for important issues. Last week, I hope you joined us uh, to speak with Joel Merchant about the importance of having conversations about the end of our lives. And today we're with the Eighth Principal Task Force to talk about reforming cash bail. And I wanna also echo the idea that there are abolitionists among us who want to see uh, bail ended, if not a complete reimagination and, uh, and reformation of the way we practice justice in our culture. But we are going ahead with, um, with uh, the strategies that we are trying to build coalitions around one of the reasons we're having this kind of pauhana is that is a few i just want to touch on them briefly this this is an emergency i i don't want to say this in a way that it gets over overdone or overwrought but there there are simply for constitutional reasons uh there are unconstitutional uses of uh of the justice system at work in our culture and uh right now there are people sitting uh, unconstitutionally in in jails. Uh, not to mention, you know, regardless of the legal take, it's just uh, from a human rights perspective, it's wrong, impractical, uh, and costly. I mean, there's so many reasons why we want to address this. Um, the history of cash bail we could get into from a legal perspective, but uh, I'll just say that the results of it, rather than the beginning and the end, are that 
uh, is the penalization of people of color and but in particular poor people, uh, which it's more that it tends to be people in uh, many cultures who are of color that tend to be poor. And so uh, this is a system that is privileging those with money and um, hindering those without it. Part of what we're doing here and why we're looking at this uh, reform cash bail mo movement is so that we can act cooperatively in this situation that uh, might lead to a co-liberation. This is a co-liberation opportunity uh, and it's a movement we might move forward. It's not the end of the movement, but it's the beginning. And the other last thing is that if you're someone who hasn't really had a reason or a way to, um, to work within our legislature, uh, to lobby, to do these kinds of actions, this is a very practical, tangible way to start this process. And I hope that you will take the opportunity to do that and to learn from the wonderful people we have helping us today. So that is uh, what I have to say about why we're all here. So I'm glad that you're all here and I hope we can have a wonderful uh, hour together. Yeah. So uh, one of the things we are going to do now is take a look at a short TED talk that talks about the problem of cash bail. So we will show this now. And uh, I hear that there's some noise in the background of some of the folks. I could go around muting folks, but if you could maybe take care of your own uh, mutes while we start this, that would be great. <laughs> Since 2000, the annual number of people convicted of crimes in the United States has stayed steady, but the average number of people in jail each year has shot up. How can that be? The answer lies in the bail system, which isn't doing what it was intended to do. The term bail refers to the release of people awaiting trial on condition that they return to court to face charges. Countries around the world use many variations of bail, and some don't use it at all. The U.S. bail system relies primarily on what's called cash bail, which was supposed to work like this. When a person was accused of a crime, the judge would set a reasonable price for bail. The accused would pay this fee in order to be released from jail until the court reached a verdict on the case. Once the case ended, whether found guilty or innocent, they'd get the bail money back if they made all their court appearances. The rationale behind this system is that under U.S. law, people are presumed innocent until proven guilty, so someone accused of a crime should not be imprisoned unless they've been convicted of a crime. But today, the bail system in the U.S. doesn't honor the presumption of innocence. Instead, it subverts people's rights and causes serious harm, particularly to people in low-income communities and communities of color. A key reason why is the cost of bail. In order for cash bail to work as intended, the price has to be affordable for the accused. The cost of bail wasn't meant to reflect the likelihood of someone's guilt. When bail is set, the court has not reviewed evidence. Under exceptional circumstances, such as charges of very serious crimes, judges could deny bail and jail the accused before their trial judges were supposed to exercise this power very rarely and could come under scrutiny for using it too often. Setting unaffordably high bail became a second path to denying people pretrial release. Judges' personal discretion and prejudices played a huge role in who they chose to detain this way. Bail amounts climbed higher and higher, and more and more defendants couldn't pay, so they stayed in jail. By the late 19th century, these circumstances led to the rise of commercial bail bond companies. They pay a defendant's bail in exchange for a hefty fee the company keeps. Today, the median bail is $10,000, a prohibitively high price for almost half of Americans and as many as 9 out of 10 defendants. If the defendant can't pay, they may apply for a loan from a commercial bail bond company. It's completely up to the company to decide whose bail they'll pay. They choose defendants they think will pay them back, 
turning a profit of about $2 billion each year. In fact, in the past 20 years, pre-trial detention has been the main driver of jail growth in America. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people who can't afford bail or secure a loan stay in jail until their case is resolved. This injustice disproportionately affects Americans who are black and Latino, for whom judges often set higher bail than for white people accused of the same offenses. Unaffordable bail puts even innocent defendants in an impossible position. Some end up pleading guilty to crimes they did not commit. For minor offenses, the prosecution may offer a deal that credits time already spent in jail toward the accused sentence if they plead guilty. Often, the time they've already spent in jail is the total length of the sentence, and they can go home immediately, but they leave with a criminal record. Defending their innocence, meanwhile, can mean staying in jail indefinitely awaiting trial and doesn't guarantee an innocent verdict. Bail may not even be necessary in the first place. Washington, D.C. largely abolished cash bail in the 1990s. In 2017, the city released 94% of defendants without holding bail money, and 88% of them returned to all their court dates. The nonprofit organization The Bail Project provides free bail assistance to thousands of low-income people every year, removing the financial incentive that bail is designed to create. The result? People come back to 90% of their court dates without having any money on the line, and those who miss their court dates tended to because of circumstances like childcare, work conflicts, or medical crises. Studies have also found that holding people in jail before trial, often because they cannot afford cash bail, actually increases the likelihood of re-arrests and re-offending. The damage of incarcerating people before their trials extends to entire communities and can harm families for generations. People who are incarcerated can lose their livelihoods, homes, and access to essential services, all before they've been convicted of a crime. It's also incredibly expensive. American taxpayers spend nearly $14 billion every year incarcerating people who are legally presumed innocent. This undermines the promise of equal justice under the law, regardless of race or wealth. The issues surrounding cash bail are symptomatic of societal problems like structural racism and over-reliance on incarceration that need to be addressed. In the meantime, reformers like the Bail Project are working to help people trapped by cash bail and to create a more just and humane pretrial system for the future. With the help of TED, the Bail Project is working to increase decarceration and reduce disparities in the application of criminal justice. You can learn more about their work and get involved at audaciousproject.org slash bail. Let's go help people customize and save. You need to unmute. Okay, thank you for that, Reverend TJ. Um, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, you may put them in the chat. Um, but I'd like to move on and give a little context about what cash bail looks like here in our state of Hawaii. Um, I recently learned about what's called the Hawaii Correctional Systems Oversight Commission. It's a relatively new um, commission, and I went to last month's meeting. And one of the things they discussed was a review of the Oahu Intake Services Center activities. And one of the commissioners of this oversight commission um, explained that the role of the Oahu Intake Service Center is to review arrestees to determine if they could be diverted. And um, the commission wanted to know what the number of, and this is their language, pre-trial misdemeanors. I prefer people who may have committed misdemeanors and pre-trial felons, again, um, people who may have committed felonies for August, September. So this question was posed during the commission meeting. And the director of the Department of Public Safety, Max Otani reported, 
that there were 214 pre-trial misdemeanors at the Oahu Intake Center. And of those 214 people, 48 were released, 45 were admitted to OCCC, the prison, and 122 of those individuals took the plea deals that you heard about in the TED Talk video. Okay. Um, it was also revealed at this meeting that the average length of stay for these people is 29 days of pretrial detention. So that's almost one month that they're staying. They haven't been convicted of a crime. They've only been accused of a misdemeanor and they're sitting in jail on an average of 29 days. Um, I did the math. Um, I took 29 days and um, the cost per day of holding these people in pretrial detention is about $219. So that would equal $6,148 per person. Also, I want you to keep in mind that those people taking the plea deals, how many was that was 122 people, they may have been found innocent had they gone to court. And because they took the plea deal, we will be paying for their incarceration. I also want to amplify that the number of arrests and pre-trial detainees are disproportionately Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And the numbers that I shared um, previously may have been on the lower side, just simply due to the COVID pandemic. So I wanna tell you a little bit about Act 179. It went into effect January 1st, 2020 in the state of Hawaii. It was passed through our legislation, our legislators um, passed it. And it requires the State Department of Public Safety to forward the findings from the pre-trial inmate status reviews to the courts, to prosecutors, and to any defense lawyers involved, okay? So this is a state law and it's very recent. It just went into effect last year. Well, there was a recent Civil Beat article just this past September with the headline that the state appears lax in reviewing the cases of people sitting in jail awaiting trial. And the first paragraph read, for years, Hawaii has debated what to do about accused lawbreakers who sit in overcrowded jails, sometimes for many months and even years, because they cannot afford to post bail. Now, an important piece of that messy, expensive issue has landed on the docket of the Hawaii State Supreme Court. And the article goes on to say, in a lengthy filing late last month, state public defender James Tabe urged the court to enforce that 2019 law, Act 179, that mandates correction, corrections officials review pretrial detainees every three months to reconsider whether those prisoners should remain in custody or should be released. And the 2019 law says the reviews must be forwarded again to prosecutors, defense lawyers, and the courts. But officials with the state judiciary, the Kauai Prosecutor's Office, and Top 8 all say they haven't seen these reports. Nothing has been filed with their offices. Now, Kat Brady, who many of you know as a longtime friend of our church and a prominent activists for um, people caught up in the carceral system here in Hawaii. She had a little note. She said, in response to the filing, the Hawaii Supreme Court ordered the Department of Public Safety to follow the law, go figure. And, um, and there weren't any sanctions like most people who break the law. So just wanted to put that out. So even though these laws are passed, they're not necessarily being followed up on, okay? And that's kind of where we come in to hold them accountable. And my last big takeaway from this oversight commission meeting was when another commissioner, Ronald Ibarra, he's the former chief judge of the third 
um, Circuit Court of Hawaii, he talked about the purpose of bail. He said, number one, it's to ensure the person shows up in court. All the studies show that people do show up and there's ways to um, engage people and help them get to court. Text messages, offer rides, you know, maybe provide childcare. There's things we as a community can do to help people make their court appearances. And then he said the second purpose of bail is to protect public safety. And former Judge Ibarra said the easiest way was no cash bail for low level crimes. And he just said jail is not the answer for these folks. And he encouraged us to not only reach out to our legislators and the prosecutor's office, but reach out to judges because even though um, our legislators may pass law, it's the judges who actually, you know, ensure that these the laws are enacted and followed through with. And we really need to get our judges on board with this no cash bail reform. So with that, um, there is another, this is a very short video and I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. So um, yeah, TJ, did you wanna queue up the next video? I do, but I wanted to just say first, thank you, Lee, for that comprehensive and helpful uh, breakdown. I hope folks will consider sending this uh, Pauhana uh, to folks uh, to see, but I wanted to bring up one really helpful thing that you mentioned, Lee, is that uh, it's one of those areas that the statistics could not be more clear, that people do show up to their hearings if it virtually in all jurisdictions, including in federal and immigration law, it is one of the biggest myths that is out there that these quote, quote, these people won't show up. And it's just wrong. If in your day to day life, you hear anything like that, please feel confident to say, I'm sorry, you're mistaken. <laughs> you know, you really, mm -hmm. need to, uh, you know, you need to look at that because people do show up. Uh, I see a, a question from uh, Kathy asking, what is a misdemeanor? Uh, this goes state by state. Their uh, misdemeanors tend to be sort of violations, misdemeanors, and then felonies. Uh, misdemeanors tend to be certain kinds of offenses that are under a certain amount of money. Uh, so usually some kind of property crime under $250, uh, things like that are in the more the misdemeanor area. Um, and then uh, felonies tend to have different thresholds that relate to the potential for bodily harm or actual bodily harm and certain amounts of money in contention uh, with regard to any kind of theft or other kind of uh, unlawful procurement of the funds. I can so, give a couple of examples of misdemeanors, just so people know how minor they are. Sure. Uh, it, it, sure, go ahead. Uh, minor in possession of alcohol is a misdemeanor. And it would, uh, a person that was 18 or over could be a, a between 18 and 21 could be arrested for minor in possession of alcohol. If he didn't have anybody to bail him out or her out and didn't have the money, they would be sitting in jail. Um, uh, shoplifting under $100 is a misdemeanor. So uh, an 18 year old girl uh, swipes a tube of lipstick and gets caught 30 days. I mean, it, we're not talking about uh, any kind of weapon. We're not talking about uh, any kind of crime, you know, that is gonna hurt somebody. We're talking about very minor things. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah. There was, there was a, a question uh, in the chat and uh, yeah, thank you for that, Kathy. Did you wanna say something, Lee? I apologize. I was just gonna, I think, refer to um, Sonia's question. Is that what you were gonna go to? Yeah, please go yeah. ahead. So um, Sonia message, so curious as to what outreach to judges look like. Is it training or is it inviting them to our church for community dialogue? Um, that's a really good question, Sonia. We, 
we're, <laughs> we're kind of learning as we go. Um, one of the best phrases in abolition work is a million different uh, little experiments. Um, Miriam Kaba said that. And so we're trying to figure these things out. I have reached out to Judge Ibarra, who I quoted in that previous section. And um, I'm gonna invite him to some of the educational pieces we have coming up. I'm gonna ask him to reach out to that fraternity or whatever it is of judges and former judges and you know invite them to get on board with this. So thank you for asking. And if anybody has any um, suggestions, if anybody has inroads with any judges, that would be amazing. And, and really one of the, the goals, as much as the, the power of getting judges to change the way that they run their courtrooms, most judges right now are listening to recommendations from prosecuting attorneys and getting the state attorneys to change the philosophy uh, in this, perhaps because of the legislature telling them they have to, is uh, the progress we are talking about. But yes, uh, creative solutions to uh, judges deciding on their own or in other ways that this is unlawful uh, or simply unworkable uh, are also uh, really helpful. So, uh, and we're gonna hear more in a video about how this is actually working in other jurisdictions. So if you're looking for ways to start convincing people, having things like the video you're about to see at your disposal are among those important things. Okay, so we'll share that. It used to be that you were charged with a crime. A judge set a bail amount, and if you couldn't afford it, you'd stay in jail until your trial. That changed nearly five years ago when New Jersey enacted criminal justice reform. Now that they've got an outstanding system that determines whether or not someone's going to be held over in jail based upon risk factors, whether they're going to return, whether they're a dangerous society, rather than if they have the monetary amount of money to get out. And, and that makes a heck of a lot more sense. Data from a new report by New Jersey courts confirms the change in the system has resulted in more serious offenders and fewer low-risk defendants awaiting pretrial in jail. In 2012, 12% 12 of inmates were waiting in jail because they couldn't afford a bail of $2,500 or less. That number has dropped to 0.2% or 14 inmates in 2020. And bail, the court spokesperson says, is only used as a last resort, usually when someone continuously fails to appear in court, which isn't happening often. The report finds the people arrested in 2019 showed up for about 90.9% .9 of court appearances. The legislation that we passed uh, several years ago is working. Another way to measure the success of bail reform is to look at how many people waiting for their trial on the outside end up being charged for new crimes. This report finds for three consecutive years, the rate has remained low, around 13.7% from 2017 to 2019. The other intended effect, which is we're saving lots of money on, uh, on taxpayers' backs. Because the jail population has been cut by roughly 40% since 2012, some counties have decided to share services to reduce costs. There's about six or seven counties that um, you know, are in those types of agreements. I would say by the end of 2021, say we'll have 14 county jails. It's a significant amount of salaries and wages and health benefit expenses that the counties that are uh, closing their jails are, uh, are, are saving. The racial disparities still remain. Black defendants make up nearly 60% of all the people incarcerated in New Jersey on a one-day snapshot in 2020. And 68% New Jersey courts say were charged with serious offenses. As Chief Justice Stuart Rabner writes, black defendants are more likely than white defendants to be arrested and more likely to receive a complaint warrant, which requires a trip to jail, as opposed to a summons, which allows for immediate release. Adding, New Jersey's justice system is fairer and more equitable today under CJR. But we must continue to work together with stakeholders across the criminal justice system to confront inequities wherever we find them. Any system that, that uses prior convictions as a basis to determine whether someone is likely to 
to commit a crime in the future is likely to replicate the racial disparities that we hope to leave behind. An ACLU senior supervising attorney, Alexander Shalom, says that's still part of the formula in New Jersey. I think the courts have been very responsive to concerns about disparities. They've done an admirable job of tracking it. The next step is to start making fixes to it. Shalom says he also hopes the right to a speedy trial is also addressed since people are sitting in jail for too long, he says because of a backlog created by COVID since trials weren't happening. NJ Spotlight News, I'm Leah Mishkin. Okay, were there, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Did anyone have any questions or remarks about that last video? I do wanna say, um, New Jersey isn't alone. There's kind of a trend towards reforming cash bail across our nation. At the federal level, there is no cash bail unless the crime is so egregious, the judge decides you know, that the person needs to be in pretrial detention. I just wanna say that uh, in immigration, that's not the case. Uh, cash oh. bail in immigration is tragically laughable. Uh, I, I, I don't think I'll sleep tonight if I get into that. It's so awful. And I have friends on here who have been witness to that and can attest to it. So I just want to say more, more on that soon. But uh, the other piece I just wanted to say in this is uh, this idea of the speedy trial. People forget this is in the Bill of Rights. Uh, the way this is treated, and I don't mean to harp on it, but as like a former lawyer or whatever, this is the way this constitutional right is dealt with. Most defendants uh, who are accused are basically slipped a piece of paper with a murmur that says, just sign this. And they're literally signing away the right to a speedy trial. And if you try to enforce uh, your right to a speedy trial, the punishment, the kind of trial they will mount against you and the way uh, so often a prosecutor will take umbrage at heaven forbid that they uphold the constitution that they swore to protect when they became lawyers and then were elected uh, will rain down a holy you know what upon you. It's uh, the, just such a simple idea as, uh, and I'm sorry to harp on it, but this is what people really are uh, up against and the way people's constitutional rights are being treated in these situations. So uh, yes, I just wanted to share that. Um, Carolyn wrote something. Carolyn, I'm not sure if this is a question or a statement. Complaint warrant versus summons also true here in our state. Was that a question or a statement? A question. Okay. Yeah. I have no idea. There's two I kinds of things that can happen when you're arrested in New Jersey that are, are racially um, distinct by numbers there in New Jersey. I don't know I, if it's here too. I, I do not know. We can crowdsource this one. It, does someone know whether there are those kinds of distinctions here? My understanding is that everything is a summons here, but. Um, okay. Thanks. Sure. All right. Uh, go ahead, Lee. I was just going to say one other, um, I guess, conversation point that has really a good synergy with reforming cash bail is um, building new jails. I think they kind of go hand in hand because, as you saw in New Jersey, when you get when you reform cash bail and you're not incarcerating so many people in pretrial detention, you don't need so much jail space. And there's so much talk in our state about building a new jail. And um, I invite anyone who's kind of doing the work around um, not building a new jail, if you want to chime in. Does anyone have anything to share about that? Only from my... Um, I've also been attending the Hawaii um, Correctional System Oversight Commission, and um, they're looking at that too. And they tried to pass a bill that had to do with creating 
um, a moratorium on building a jail. Mm. And that didn't pass. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the big thing that they think gives them a green light is that they were able to get the, uh, I think it's the Hawaba Neighborhood Board to say yes to it. And it, it shouldn't come down to just one neighborhood board and it shouldn't, um, oh, yeah, well, a lot has happened, but I think we can still stop it. Thank you, uh, Carolyn. Um, and I, I have a question also. Do we know what happened to cash bail reform efforts in the legislature last year? And uh, Lee, do you want to take that or? Yeah, I, a little bit. Um, Senator Carl Rhodes, who our church is in his um, jurisdiction, were constituents of him. Um, he had put forth a Senate bill to reform cash bail. And it went fairly far. And if you go on the legislative website, uh, you can read all the testimony. And the testimony was overwhelmingly in favor of reforming cash bail. There was very little dissent. Um, the one letter was almost laughable. It was from a bail bondsman. It's like, this is a, a constitutional right. It was just laughable. But I do wanna add that it's just the US and the Philippines are the only countries in the world that have cash bail tied to a profit motive. That we have these people called bail bondsmen and you can borrow money from them and pay them a fee. Other countries do not have that profit motive tied to cash bail. Um, so in answer to your question, Reverend TJ, what I'm hearing and what um, Caprady shared was the prosecutor's office, the Honolulu prosecutor's office put the brakes on the legislation. There was also another bill in the house as well. And I think this is good news. We, at the time, I think it was an interim prosecutor, but we do have a new prosecutor. We elected him, um, Steve Alm. We elected him in the last um, led, uh, election. And he seems to be much more progressive and open-minded. So in addition to, we talked about reaching out to judges in this conversation, I really think it's important, like you had mentioned earlier, Reverend TJ, to reach out to the prosecutor's office because that apparently was one of the stumbling blocks in the last session. Yep, great. Well, thanks for all these uh, great uh, comments. Just a, a note, just to read uh, Raylan's comment, bail hearings are open to the public and bail watching puts pressure on judges and prosecutors. I would encourage volunteers to do bail watching in Hawaii. It's eye-opening and effective pressure. Um, I, I observe uh, many immigration proceedings. Uh, it helps wearing a collar, uh, but you, I'll loan you some if y'all want one. <laughs> and, uh, be happy to do daily ordinations uh, for the purposes of bail uh, monitoring. Uh, but there's often questions from the bench. Who's that, who's that person lurking in the back? Uh, and I've heard from lawyers, it really does make a difference in the way the judge dispenses uh, with the duties that is before her or him. Uh, so great. Or, uh, do we want to move on to the next uh, segment? Here? Uh, and I'm going to pass it on to Carla, who's going to tell you about our exciting action opportunity around reforming cash bail. Thanks, Carla. So first, could I ask Raylan how I was trying to tap, uh, put this in the chat. How, how does somebody go about watching these bail hearings? And if it's too much to put in the chat or, or say right now, uh, we can find out and get that information out to folks. I actually um, did call this morning to uh, check on the uh, arraignment hearings for felony court and because they were closed for a long time because of COVID. And I found out this morning that they are open again and anyone can show up 
um, to sit in and watch, except if there's too many people uh, that are de defendants that have to be there and there's not enough room to space, then they'll ask other people that are not necessary to step out. But um, they said it is open. And I did get asked, I got passed around and asked by a couple of people who I was and why I was asking. Um, so bail watching, I ha I'll tell you in 2019, myself and another volunteer, we watched over at least 150 bail hearings, felony bail hearings. And it's shocking. It, it's shocking at um, how little thought is put into it and um, literally minutes for each bail hearing. So there's no, I mean, and it's all happening over video. Um, I don't think most people even understood what was going on, but you, you know, you honestly, if you go and see it, you'll get, you'll, you'll feel it right off. Oh, you only have to go to one hearing, 30 bail hearings within less than an hour. And you could just see how unfair it is. Can so. I, can I just make a pastoral and other suggestion? Go, go with someone if you can. I know it sounds kind of funny, but like, not maybe it doesn't sound funny, but I would I would bring someone with you so you can, there's a lot going on and having two sets of ears and someone to kind of talk it out with. And also just witnessing all of that alone can kind of be hard. Uh, so just my two cents. Um, and also just, you know, bring a friend, you know, it, it's and more and both of you will learn. So uh, yeah, just uh, think about that. So yeah. Thanks so much, Raylan. Thanks, Raylan. Yeah, and at the very beginning, uh, Lee promised there would be action. So um, as she said, our social justice council, our door group, and the Eighth Principal Task Force is really enthusiastically asking everybody in our congregation, the friends of our congregation, to uh, participate in this whole reform cash bail campaign. And it's being launched and designed by Faith Action. Uh, the new transformative justice task force and Rev Kyle's here and thank you so much for that sermon on Sunday as as Rev Kyle said she refers to this campaign as faith with its boots on so we need to get our boots on we know how to do postcards like I don't need to preach about postcards because you all have done this and um and we know that it's effective. Uh, Representative uh, Sandy Gannigan, I think it was Ray Lynn talked to him and he was just raving about all of our postcards taped all over their office. So um, we wanna do this postcard campaign. And if you see uh, my Zoom background and um, Lee's, thanks to Rev Kyle, she had this idea. And so we're copying her. Uh, this is the postcard. And Faith Action is, has uh, ordered these postcards. They're also providing stamps. So, and I can tell you that Rev Kyle and team have created a very uh, short and sweet message for these postcards. So it should help provide any write, uh, prevent writer's cramp. Um, so here's some of the facts about it. We're gonna have the postcards available for our congregation before the end of November. So there's a real heads up uh, for everybody. And the, the mail date requested is on or before December 16th. If you can't make it till after that's fine, but we'd, we'd like to kind of see them flowing in in lovely numbers um, during that time period. So we're gonna, uh, the packets are gonna be put together and there's gonna be six or 12. And uh, in the packets are gonna be the postcards, the stamps, all the writing instructions like we've done before with the sample message, who it's going to, all the addresses. Um, so if you wanna do six postcards, who we're asking you to send those to, and this, all this information will be provided, is your state house representative and your state senator. And then, for supportive legislators, because we really want these 
folks to know that they have community support. Sometimes they don't get a lot of thanks. And so we wanna do that. If you're up for adding 12 postcards, then we'll add six additional legislators and we're going after uh, folks who hold the most power, powerful positions in the House and the Senate. So all you need to do to play, and we're asking you to sign up tonight and uh, so we can get started here. Uh, Lee Curran, can you drop your email address into the chat? We, yeah, so just request postcard packet or packets. Um, you need to let Lee know how many packets you want and if you want six or 12. And um, we're also looking for volunteers who want to deliver postcards. We already have several, Raylan, Hillary, me. I mean, we, we want to be able to deliver if we can. And, you know, we also recognize that there are folks who, you know, handwriting postcards is not really the easiest thing for some folks. And so we want to make sure everybody can participate because you can send the same message via email and, and you also make phone calls and leave voice messages or talk to the aides that are in the office. And if you want to do that, let Lee know because we'll get that information to you so you can also participate. So we hope everybody will be really gung ho. And this is this postcard project is one of the one of the things. <laughs> Here's Allison. She's already volunteering to take twelve. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> thanks, Allison. Um, so this is one of the elements of this reform cash bail. So tonight, other things that are coming up. Oop! There's Rev. TJ getting in on the action. Twelve for him. Um, so, so yeah, if, if you have any questions about postcards, ask now or Lee, but um, I think it, when I scroll through the folks here, I know that most of you have participated and um, I personally get great joy when I read each one because I feel I'm actually doing something. Okay. Thank you, Carla. That was magnificent. You got me all pumped up. <laughs> so um, let's see. So I uh, oh, they oh, they're just flowing in. Ooh. I love it. Thank you, folks. Wow, this is amazing. Um, are there any last questions or comments that um you folks want to put out there? We still have a little bit of time left. I also want to recognize um, Carla, Kathy, and I are on the Faith Action Transformative Justice Task Force, as is Reverend Kyle, who's on this call, and Kylie Akiona, who's on this call. Kylie's actually my co-facilitator of the task force, so it's wonderful having you folks here. So, oh, let's see, Raylan. Raylan says, Court bail watching is happening across the country, so you can search the internet and read about programs in other states, just an FYI. And that's really what we're doing. We're just hitting the um, internet hard, doing the research, going to Zoom webinars, and just learning as much as we can. So, yeah, let's see. Wow. I just... Yeah, well, go ahead. Well, yeah, while people are tallying up, I've removed the spotlight so people can easily see the full uh, Brady Bunch view here. Uh, but I did, since unless there are specific questions, I did want to maybe give some other members of the Transformative Justice Task Force a moment uh, of, to just say a few words of encouragement or if they heard anything that they'd like to emphasize or anything they didn't hear that they feel like we should. Uh, I just wanted uh, Reverend Lovett uh, Kylie and uh, other folks uh, and uh, uh, who are on the task force to uh, feel free to unmute themselves and let us hear uh, what it is they think should be shared. I also see that our friend Cassie Chi is on the call. If there's something from Faith Action that she'd like to share, uh, would any of those like to just say a few words? Good Lord, you give a clergy open mic. You got what? 
Um, I, I would like to share two things, although Esther actually raised her hand. So maybe I'll oh. hold on just a second. Great, Esther, please go ahead. I think those are very effective, um, compelling videos that you showed us. And I would like to be able to share them with other people. Is there a way that I can send a link to them or an, an address for them to other people that I'd like to explain this issue to and get them I, on board? So. I will send them right after the email to you or right after Pauhana to you, Esther. Mm -hmm. And if anyone else would like them, please just go ahead and say, I don't know. Oh, so I'm seeing Carol raise her hand. Just raise your hand. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Great. I'll just watch this section of Pauhana so I can see who raised their hands because it's going to be also the videos will be in this Pauhana. So if you want people to just see the whole thing, you can send this. Otherwise, I'll make sure everyone has those by uh, by the end of the night tonight. So there's a lot of other hands now. All right. Thank you, Esther, for getting us started. Uh, can I lower my hand now, even though I still want you to send it? Yes. Yes. OK. OK. Uh, are these questions or people who want the videos? Junko and David. Okay. Uh, Allison. Okay. Kimberly. I just wanted the video. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then uh, Jill and Kimberly. I just want, want the video? Just okay. Want the video. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Then maybe we'll turn it back over to, uh, oh, sorry, Kimberly, did you have a question or you want the video, the videos? Okay. Uh, then we'll turn it over to Reverend Kyle. Thank you for that, Reverend Kyle. <laughs> Thank you. I wanna echo what Cassie put in the chat, which uh, is that the Transformative Justice Task Force learned a lot from Carla. And I want to amplify that to all of you who are on this Pauhana there are lots of folk in lots of churches that are just starting to learn about cash bail and have themselves never written postcards to their elected leaders. So you're having um, um, done that and, and being able to say, are being able to say that there's lots of folk that do that. And if anybody is afraid, we can hook you up with somebody who's done it before um, and, and you're, you know, to hold hands and to go together down this journey. Um, has really been encouraging to a lot of folk. Um, and we're very excited for the witness that you all have provided to encourage other folk to get on board with some of this uh, faith with the boots on. All right, would uh, Cassie or Kylie like to uh, raise any, uh, lift anything up for us? Um, aloha kako, my name is Kylie. I'm the co-facilitator of the Transformative Justice Task Force. Um, I'm very new to Faith Action, so thank you everyone for welcoming it, eh, welcoming me into this space. Um, I wasn't prepared to say anything tonight, but I just want to say thank you everyone for all of your support and for being here tonight. And um, thank you so much to Reverend TJ, um, Lee, and Carla for your amazing organizing. This is so amazing. I'm in awe of all of your work and yeah, mahalo everyone. Thanks so much for being here, Kylie. Cassie, we miss you. Do you want to say anything or are you just listening tonight? I'll jump in. I was eating my eating my dinner between meetings, but um, yeah, just good to be with this group. I think Kylie, um, Lee, Rep and Kyle co covered everything, but I'm really inspired by the work that you folks have already done. And I think it really kickstarted the rest of Faith Action. So thank you. All right. I think we'll go to Lee for, uh, for a wrap up. Okay. Am I unmuted? Can you folks hear me? We hear you just fine. Lee. Okay, very good. Let me, um, here we go. Okay, so we're ending our evening and I just wanna thank all of you again for showing up and um, just being open to doing this really important work of collaboration. Um, I just wanna give you a reminder that this is a wonderful opportunity to widen the circle of concern um, that phrase is known to us Unitarian Universalists, 
but basically it's just caring for our community. And um, moving away from harmful binaries like crime, punishment, and law-abiding citizen versus criminal, and moving to a place of recognizing and promoting everyone's humanity and well-being with concern, care, and compassion. Please pay attention to announcements and information going out about the postcard campaign. I think I jotted down all your messages and requests for postcards. I hope I got you. If you don't hear anything from me within like a week, please reach out to me at dflcurrent at gmail.com. And um, yeah, there's more opportunities to learn and engage. Our transformative um, justice task force is sponsoring a panel discussion on December 1st with uh, three legislators. That would be representatives Gannadin, um, Mato Matayoshi and um, Senator Rhodes. They're gonna present their proposed cash bail um, reform legislation for the next session. And we'll have an opportunity to learn about their proposals, to ask questions, and just really engage with this. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate you all showing up tonight. Thank you, Lee. And thank you for the blessing of your wisdom and your thought and your care and for everyone who contributed to this and, uh, and all of the work. And just as we close in these last few minutes, just want to take a moment and just, folks, just think about what people are going through to in their lives to get to this place, the ways that the forces are working against them, the ways that so much of what is supposed to be justice is perverted in the face of what is supposed to be helping society and really just hurting those who are already hurting the most. Uh, I just want to bless all the work that folks are doing here and, uh, and the way we'll be serving our community going forward with this work and much more. So I just want to thank everyone for their spirit, for their time, and for their heart and for their uh, future action here. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, have a wonderful evening. If you have any questions, uh, just be in touch with Lee or with me and we'll get it worked out. All right. And here's to success. Yes, yes. thank you. Let's yeah. do this. Yes, let's indeed. <laughs>